our next section will be about how to assess K2 coding. So we've talked about the standards, kind of where we're coming from, what different learning outcomes we might be looking towards uh, for our K2 students. And now we're going to talk specifically about methods for evaluation. And again, I mentioned it on the last slide, but you get to decide what success looks like in your computer science classroom. There's no one way to teach and measure progress in coding for elementary students. So the essential question becomes, if we want to approach measuring progress in like a holistic way, but the standards are not one size fits all, what methods can we actually employ that will reflect the unique experiences and strengths of our students? And this is where I believe that formative, authentic assessment is crucial. And the methods I'm going to chat about today, um, the three of them were developed at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, where they're conducting research about computer science assessments in elementary grades. And they've outlined three approaches to assessing computational thinking, which is what I will touch on now. And I'm going to mention engagement at the end, um, but I think that these three evaluation strategies plus a general measurement of your student engagement uh, will make for a really strong uh, assessment strategy. Um, I do love this quote from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Uh, in one of their research papers, they mentioned that most concept-oriented assessments, like quizzes on the definitions of concepts, were insufficient in representing a learner's development as a computational thinker. So that just sort of gives an introduction for the idea that quizzes and tests about coding concepts might not be enough, and we'll figure out some other ways to, uh, to reflect learning. So first up is artifact-based interviews. So this is one, the first method that they mention that can be used to gauge computational thinking skills. So in this approach, learners are engaged in some sort of conversation about their computational product, so like what project they're working on in class and how. So typically these, it's called an interview, but I think of it more like a conversation, are with a student using a work sample, something the student has produced to guide the discussion. It's just a conversation. So basically learners have a chance to describe what they worked on and why. And there's a ton of ways that interviews like this can happen. Commonly it would be with a teacher, but I understand that interviewing all, if you have like 50 students, interviewing all of them one-on-one -on -one about a project might be really time consuming. These conversations can also be peer to peer. They can be formal or like an informal check-in throughout class, kind of in passing. And it can even be tracked with a rubric if that's desirable and will help you stay organized. I included a screenshot here of an example ru rubric that the graduate school offers that shows some example questions that you might pose to your students about the, the coding project that they're working on, and then different ways to score um, their types of responses. You can see that the questions are super open-ended. I mean, it's important to approach any sort of conversation like this with an open-minded mentality. So why this method? Um, during conversations, learners might offer insights or reasoning for their decisions that you, the teacher, may not have been aware of. And taking time to have these conversations, it'll really help students build confidence knowing that their work matters, it's worth the time to talk about it, um, and that you are curious to learn more about it. Downside, downsides, as I mentioned, uh, depending on how many students you teach, in interviewing all of them about their work could be very involved, but I just feel like this type of evaluation, this type of interview, when it comes to a coding project where there's so many layers and different mindsets and concepts that are coming into it, you can really dig in and find nuggets of insight that, you're, that you had no idea your student was thinking about when they created what they did. All right, the second evaluation method after um, the artifact-based interviews is design scenarios. 
So in this approach, learners will encounter like a series of creative projects or challenges and engage with them using knowledge and skills that they've developed over time. So this method is effective because it invites students to synthesize their learning. Um, they're going to use a bunch of skills that they've developed in new, creative, innovative ways. So as the teacher, you're able to evaluate not only if they're applying certain concepts correctly, like, for example, are they showing, are they demonstrating an understanding of sequence? Is the code that they wrote or the blocks they put together or the puzzle they're trying to solve is the answer in the correct sequence, but also how creative the application of that knowledge is. Projects, design scenarios are open-ended and there's not one right way to solve them. So students can really synthesize their own learning and what they found important um, in their own way. Another really interesting way to use design scenarios would be to do sort of like a reverse a reverse process. So you, the teacher, could create a project or find a project that exists online already from another teacher and then have students evaluate it by explaining what the project does, describing how it could be extended or added to, um, finding a, a bug in the project or a, a, an error and trying to fix it, or taking the project and remixing it in their own way. So this type of process where it's like a design scenario but flipped, where the students are doing the critique, it'll really demonstrate if students have a grasp on the mechanics of the project and if they know enough about the content to add and remix it. So I love, love this assessment method. Uh, students can approach it in their own way. There's no one right way to solve it. So every child has the opportunity to be successful and bring self-expression to the projects. And again, there are rubrics and different tools out there that can help you evaluate projects like this, design scenarios. But again, since you know your students best, um, you can really lead the charge there. And I included images here from different projects. We have available at Codable where this sort of design scenario uh, could take place. And the final method that the Harvard Graduate School recommends for assessing computational thinking is learner documentation. So in this approach, learners are engaged in developing um, like reflective traces of their learning as an accompaniment to any other creations or work that they've done. So one approach to learner documentation that I've seen um, it, for a lot of teachers work well is to have students create a design journal in which they are reflecting on their process and their progress throughout a project. And I think self-reflection like this is really important. It will help highlight areas in which learners demonstrate self-efficacy, self-confidence, and may also illuminate areas where students might be struggling. That's not obvious just from looking at the project or looking at their work, um, but they might dig into it when asked to reflect on it later. And it's basically just an added layer that goes beyond the what and the when of schoolwork and hones in on the why and the how of it. Uh, if we only look at the quantifiable amount of work that a child has completed in a given time period, we'd miss a lot of nuance. So learner documentation and reflection is crucial. And then my final piece on these evaluation methods, what about rubrics, quizzes, tests? I, I think all of these are still okay. I, in fact, I think rubrics are extremely useful tools. I mentioned one on the artifact-based interview slide. Um, I'm definitely not one of those teachers that never did a quiz or a test, but I do recognize that it's difficult to capture student performance like in a set time period in one hour and 30 minutes. So feel free to incorporate these. You probably won't want to rely on them as your st sole means of evaluation, especially for computer science education, because there are 
so many nuances to computational thinking, so many softer skills that are really difficult to capture in a quiz or a test. So these tools are still useful. Definitely not saying to throw them aside. Just recognize that for a, for a subject as intricate as computer science, um, having more of these self-reflective pieces, projects, conversations uh, will be needed to kind of get to the bottom of it. And then finally, before we move on to a breakdown of project-based learning, I will just take one minute to talk engagement. I feel like this is a real buzzword, especially in the age of virtual learning. Uh, but it is important here, especially with coding education. Uh, measuring progress is informative for your teaching practice. Standards are useful, absolutely. And demonstrating learning to admin and parents is, of course, very important. But I do invite you to think about why you want to bring coding into your classroom in the first place. It's likely because you know coding is a skill that will benefit your students for their entire lives. It's also likely because you want to foster a love of learning and an excitement to interact with technology in new ways and a desire to persist when faced with challenges, find solutions, all of this stuff. This is all only possible if kids stick with it and if they don't give up when it gets hard because I can tell you I am currently in the process of learning how to code myself and oh boy, it really does get hard. So all of this to say that engagement and enjoyment of coding is paramount and I'd say a thousand times over that regardless of standards and evaluation methods, if your students are excited and motivated to learn, then it's a success. They will keep keep going with it. They will learn more as they grow. So at the end of the day, when you're thinking about all these different methods to gauge learning outcomes and progress, I definitely encourage you to think about how you're measuring engagement, whether that be um, time spent or number of projects created. But for a lot of students, it would just be you know, motivation and interest in continuing. So it's going to be up to you to decide what that looks like, but definitely an important piece of the puzzle. <laughs>